Good to see one of you in the services this morning, whether you're in our parking lot or you're watching online in your living room, in your PJs or wherever. So glad you are here with us and let us worship together. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's good to be back from big old Albuquerque, New Mexico. So thank you. It was great. It was great. Great trip. Kind of road weary, but uh, but we're good. We're good. Thank you so much for your prayers. Thanks for blowing up our phones last week. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was great. That was great. So, all right, let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessings, Lord. Just uh, we thank you for uh, the weather that you give us, Lord, and the rain, and, and this morning that uh, holding off with the rain that we can come and worship outside here in the parking lot, uh, in our living rooms across the, uh, across the world, actually. Um, Lord, we thank you for your love. Help us just to keep on keeping on for you with the services today that may truly come together and truly worship you. Help us just to not be distracted, to listen to your word, listen to the Holy Spirit speaks to us, Lord, and through the music, through the preached word, we just pray that your awesome will be done. We love you, and in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. All right. Let's sing together. I know I, 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 I failed to send out the lyrics, but hopefully you can, uh, you've can. you sang these songs enough that you can pick it, pick it up, and we can sing together. Seek first. Shipping with us online. Happy Father's Day to you guys too. And I just appreciate all our dads, all our fathers, what you do for us. I got to have dinner with mine last night. I don't get to do that very often. 
But that was good for us as well. You know, it doesn't take much to be a dad. Anybody can be a dad. Any guy. Let me rephrase that, okay? Can be a dad. But to be a father, to be a daddy, an Abba father, we have an Abba father, don't we? So, happy Father's Day to you fathers. Thank you for what you do for us. And we just want to love on you guys a little bit today too. So again, welcome to our digital campus. Welcome to our parking lot. I am I'm excited about what God's got planned. And you'll be happy to know we found every one of you a shady spot for this morning. Isn't that good? All right, let's sing. All righty. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I hope that you, you've determined that already a long time ago. That as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Next song we sing is entitled, Open the Eyes of My Heart. 
And that's where it all starts. Amen? Amen. Amen. It starts in the heart. And that's where God looks uh, in the heart where uh, things are, where things matter. Uh, so let's uh, sing, Open me eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. on camera today for you guys on on the digital campus okay uh no they did great last week all the musicians and everything but we miss you guys we love you guys Amen. and welcome home we're glad that that she has made the move now it makes it a little bit more challenging for the trip but it's not bad you'll enjoy it you'll enjoy that trip to be back. well good well welcome back we want to pray for the offering today. This is a time where you get to worship the Lord in your tithes and offerings. That's just another way that we worship. I know a lot of churches talk about worship, and it's all in relation to this, the music. And they think, you know, that's what worship is. No, the preaching is worship. Your tithes and your offering is worship. When you leave here today and you show up on your jobs tomorrow and all through the week, that's worship as well. 
So it's all of that. So being able to give of our tithes and offerings just a little portion of what God has blessed us with, that's a wonderful thing. So that's part of the way we worship here. So let's pray for that offering this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today and I thank you for faithful people. I thank you that even in a time like this where we have to meet in a parking lot, Lord, that you are still on the throne, you're still faithful, you still love us, and that you're still making a difference. We love you and praise you for all that you're doing. Lord, be with this offering as we take up our offering, as the offerings are sent in, or even during the week, Lord, that you would use that to your honor and your glory. Not to build our kingdom, but to build yours. To share the share with the lost, those closest to, to departing this life, Lord, that, that need you the most. Help it to be used in that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. chapter 2, verse 14, and I'll let you catch up to me when you're getting there, but have you ever bought something and it not worked when you got it? You're so excited about it getting there. You know, in today's world, we do that a lot online, don't we? 
We buy a lot of stuff online. I know my daughter bought some clothes online this week for the very first time. And she has been checking the mailbox every single day. And when we called her last night, we asked her, we said, did your packages arrive? And she was like, yes, one of them's here. And we're like, well, did you like it? Yes, it was wonderful. The red one I really like. So she was excited about this package. But have you ever ordered something and it got there and it didn't work? It was broken. Listen, a couple of years ago, I bought a barbecue. That I'm, I was excited about it. I love this style of barbecue. I've got one that we take camping all the time. So I wanted one for the house that could stay set up. So I go down to Lowe's and I buy this barbecue. And I've got this barbecue and, and, and I get it to the house. Well, when I got to Lowe's, they didn't have any more. So they told me, they said, look, we can just, you can buy it today and we will ship it to your house. And I'm thinking, well, what better thing can that be? I don't have to take it out of the car. It's just sitting on my, my doorstep one day. So the barbecue arrives one day and it's sitting on the doorstep and I'm excited about my new barbecue. But I don't have time. Isn't that how it works sometimes? Sometimes you've got a project you're in the middle of and you don't have time to finish it so it doesn't get done right away. Well, that barbecue sat in my garage for like six months. I mean, that's a long time, right? I was so excited about getting a new barbecue, but it didn't show by the time it got there because it sat in my garage for six months. So I'm looking at this barbecue one day and I'm thinking, you know what would be good tonight? Barbecue. So we need to get some barbecue going here. So I go outside and I'm thinking, we are going to get some corn on the cob. You know, we're going to bust out some of that cow sitting in the freezer. And we're going to cook that puppy up. And, and I am just ready for barbecue. I open the box. I start digging around in there. Whoa, whoa, what's this? It's broken. Six months it sat there. Nobody using it. And it's broken. And I don't mean broken. I mean broken, right? You can't put it together. The entire base was broken in four places. I'm thinking, this is crazy, right? So what do you do? You call Lowe's. And Lowe's says, I'm sorry, it's been over 60 days. You're on your own. What? This thing's brand new in the box. And I'm on my own. Listen, I was not happy. But I called the manufacturer, Weber. And Weber says, what's broke? Send me a picture, it's on the way. I'm like, I was so happy to get that barbecue together and get it working. But listen, I was not happy when it didn't work. We don't like things that are broken, do we? We don't like things that don't work. We want, we want drive-in church every week to be shady, don't we? Amen. We don't like the sunny side of the car, do we? See, I see some amens out there. I don't hear you. Okay, there's three people happy for a shady spot. Okay, I got you. But listen, we don't like broken things, do we? But I want to share with you a passage that talks about something much bigger than a barbecue or something that we ordered online. Something much, much bigger. Some shoes that don't fit. Yeah, that upsets us, but what if you went through all of life and found out in death that your faith was broken? That you had a faith that only worked in life. You didn't have a faith that worked in death. You talk about a waste of time, wouldn't it? Every drive-in church would have been a waste of time. If your faith in death does not hang on, that it is not sufficient, to get you into heaven. Broken faith. Listen, we are surrounded by broken faith every day of our lives, every day of the week. We are. You know, over 80% of Americans, when asked, say they're going to heaven. 80% of Americans. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if you've watched the news lately, answer me this. Do you think 
that 80% of Americans will be in heaven? Absolutely not. That's broken faith. They think, well, I'm a good person, generally. Really? Let's go back to Scripture and let's see what broken faith looks like. Okay? Look with me in James chapter 2 and verse 14. Now you know it's shady out when the lights come on. I just looked at my Bible and I saw light. I'm like, hey, I'm enjoying the weather. I am not complaining. I love it. Okay, James chapter 2 and verse 14. James is talking about different types of broken faith. Watch this. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says, he uses his words, he opens his mouth, and he says he has faith, but does not have works, can that faith save him? Now, I know what some of you are thinking already. Well, wait a minute. That contradicts what Paul talks about over in Ephesians, that, that, that it's through faith. It's by grace, through faith. Listen, James is not teaching two different types of salvation here. He's saying there's a relationship between faith and works. He says one doesn't earn the other. One is a result of the other. But you don't earn your salvation by being a good person. You don't earn your salvation by works. In other words, you can, you can show up at every drive-in church. You can show up at every time we open these doors, when we get back to, to whatever normal is around here. I think we've been gone so long, we've forgotten. It's been almost four months. I think next week is four months, if I'm not mistaken. But... That's insanity, right? But you can be at every one of those. You can, you can be at every vacation Bible school. You can go to every camp. You can do all of those things and still die in your sins and end up in hell. Why? Because you had a broken faith. You had a faith that doesn't work in death. It might work in life. In other words, you might be able to put on a good mask you might be able to, go to put on a good face and show up in front of the rest of us and we say, oh, they must be believers. Right? But if that faith doesn't work in death, then what good is that faith in life? It's useless. In fact, James uses those very words. But watch this in verse 14 again. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says... He has faith, but does not have faith. Now, if you go back to the Greek, <clears throat> and you take a look at the Greek and what it's talking about there in the Greek, I'm going to let the ambulance go by. One of the joys of driving church, right? The, the two verbs there talk about continuous action. And that makes a difference. In other words, it's one thing to say, I got saved today. But it's another thing to say it every single day. In other words, if I read it this way, it would be more close to what the Greek says. If someone continually claims to have faith, but they continually don't show any evidence of works, what good is that faith? That's what he's talking about there. He says there's people all over the world, all the way back to the first century, which includes our century today, that say they have faith, but their faith doesn't work in death. It's broken. He says they don't have any evidence of that faith. Now, he gives an example. If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace. Now that sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? That sounds like, go in peace. Well, that's, that's a pretty nice greeting if you ask me. But that's not what go in peace means. Go in peace is a, a Jewish term that ends a conversation. It's like saying goodbye. It's like saying, 
I'm done with this conversation, just be gone. It's also used, even today, it's also used in, in a way to, to fend off a beggar, a homeless person, somebody asking for money. When they start approaching, they would say, I, go in peace. In other words, leave me alone. This conversation, even though it has not begun, with this homeless person, with this beggar, is over. So go in peace. That's just the wave off. Right? So today, if you go to Jerusalem, if you go to the Middle East, you can still hear this in that context. Huh? Go in peace. You stay on your side of the road, I'll stay on mine. Or when they end the conversation, go in peace. Like, see you next week. But they don't mean anything by it. Look, back in verse 15, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed, um, some of your Bibles might say naked, but the idea there is that they need something. They need some sort of clothing. Right? So, he says, they need something. They're bringing you an obvious need. He says, and lacking in daily food. That's a, that's a need, isn't it? He says, and, and one of you says, go in peace. Be warmed and filled. He says, what good is that? The verse goes on to say, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Listen, I understand that there are people that want to take advantage of you. They want to take advantage of your kindness. They want to take advantage of the church. I deal with those kind of people a lot. And it's hard for us sometimes to judge between the ones that are really in need and the ones that are just going from church to church and trying to get whatever they can for nothing. Right? That's kind of the society that we live in right now, isn't it? I want something for nothing. And if you will tell me that you're going to give me something for nothing, then guess what I'll do? I'll vote you into office. That's what we like. That's because everybody, they're not in it for the team. They're not in it for the nation. They're in it for me. What's in it for me? But this passage is talking about when somebody comes to you and they actually have a need. They're, it, it's winter. They don't have a coat. They don't have whatever it takes to stay warm or cool. And you realize that's a real need. And you just say, this conversation is over. James says, what good is that? He says, that's not the kind of faith that you need to have. He says, the kind of faith that you need to have is different. In other words, true faith is more than what you say. Did you catch that? Nobody wrote it down. I didn't see anybody writing it. It's hard for me to see in your cars anyway. Listen, true faith is more than just what you say. You can put on a good mask for the rest of us and show up here and we think that you're believers and, and listen, that would be a horrible day to get to the end of your life and then find out that you had a broken faith and that Jesus one day will say to you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You had a faith that only worked in life. It's useless when it comes to death. That's the first type a broken faith that James talks about here. But watch this. There's another type. Look at verse 17. He says, There's a type of faith that's broken, that will not work in death, that does not produce a spiritual life. He says, It's more than what you say, but there should be actions to back it up. Watch this in verse 17. So also faith, by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. Now, is that contradicting Paul? No. He's saying, you got to have the faith first. There is an order to this. I'm going to turn this way so the, the wind doesn't blow in my mic for a minute. So, sorry on camera. Um, but there's a faith. In other words, there is an order to this. You don't, you don't do works to earn your faith. You get faith. And then evidence of that faith 
produces a spiritual life. It results in works. Good works. Look at this in verse um, 18. He says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. In other words, you can see my faith. Watch this. He says, Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now that sounds like a big loop, doesn't it? It sounds like a big circle. What he's saying there, what he's saying there is, listen, prove to me that you have faith without works. When you, if you say you have faith, prove it. And try doing it without backing it up with evidence. How are you going to prove something in court without evidence? You're not. If you stand up and say, but judge, I'm a good person. But judge, my intentions were good. But judge, he's going to say, you got any witnesses? You got any evidence at all? You got anything that you could, you got any exhibits? Exhibit A, exhibit B, what you got? Because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the evidence. That's what James is saying. James is saying, listen, there's another type of broken faith. It's more than just what you say. A true faith produces a spiritual life. What James is doing is helpful to us that call ourselves believers because what he's saying is you and I can evaluate our own faith. He's saying you can look at your life and you can see if there's evidence. You can look at your life and you can see is, it more than, is there more to my faith than just what I say. And you can look at your life and you can say, am I more spiritually led today than I was before I got saved? He says you can evaluate that yourself. Look at verse um, 19. He says, you believe that God is one? Good for you. You get a sticker. Right? That's what James is saying. He says, good for you. You believe that God is one? He says, boom, there's your sticker. You were in attendance. He says, but it doesn't stop there. It goes deeper than that. And we need more than that for true faith. He says, even the demons believe. Now wait a minute. Is that another contradiction there? That whosoever believeth in Him, John 3.16, has eternal life. The word here in the Greek for believe is not that they believe in the sense of salvation. It's just that they believe they exist. You believe that George Washington existed. You don't trust in him for your salvation, do you? That type of belief is a totally different type of belief than what we talk about when we talk about salvation. So he says... They even believe. He says, and the demons are smarter than you all. What? How in the world are they smarter than me? Because they go a step above what you're doing. You're just saying you have it. The, the, the demons say, oh no, we don't just say it. We know it to be true. And the verse goes on to say, and they shudder. What? We don't shudder, do we? We take God for granted. We use Him as our get out of jail free card, don't we? And we depend on Him to, to take us out of the messes that we put ourselves in. Right? If you live a life of financial irresponsibility and then you wind up in, in bankruptcy court and then all of a sudden you start praying, God help me in my finances. Uh, yeah, church, hey, could you put me on the prayer list? For, okay, are you are you well? Well, yeah, yeah, it's just my finances. They're a wreck. I owe a lot of people a lot of money. Oh yeah, that's how God works. He lets you dig yourself a hole and then He says, I'll be your bailout on the other end. I don't think that's what He's talking about. God says there's a consequence to sin. There's a consequence to living a, a life 
of financial irresponsibility. There's a consequence to living a, a life of promiscuity. You understand? Or do I need to paint a picture? Because we can go into detail there if you want me to. He says there's a consequence to that. But listen, when the test result comes back that you're positive, that you're pregnant, God says, I'm not just a bailout God. That's not my role. He says, I'm here to, sick, to, to heal the sick and the lost. He says, I'm not the bailout. There is a consequence to sin. And James is pointing out here, he says, there's got to be evidence. Otherwise, you have a broken faith. If you've, got, if you've got a faith that does not produce a spiritual life, James says, that's a broken faith and it only works here on this earth. It won't work in death. That's broken. He says the demons believe. In other words, think about it. Where did they come from? <clears throat> Where did Satan come from? Where did he start out? Trust me, Satan believes and he knows it for a fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He knows that. He was there. He got kicked out of heaven. He knows it more than some of us know it because he was an eyewitness. He just doesn't like it. The demons just don't like it. They want things their own way. So they get kicked out of heaven and now, this passage here in James, in verse 19, says, Good job, you believe that Jesus exists. Good job, you get a sticker. He says, you're not doing anything that the demons aren't doing. Because they believe that too. He says, there's no evidence in your life. There ought to be evidence. It ought to produce a spiritual life. And if it doesn't, James says, you and I can evaluate our own faith. We don't need somebody else to judge us, do we? Watch this in verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Now watch this. Over in verse 17, he says, at the very end of that verse, he says that kind of faith is dead. Doesn't he? He says that faith is dead. He even says it again in verse 26. That that kind of faith is dead. But I like the verbiage here in verse 20 where he says it's useless. Because that's deeper than dead. You understand that, right? Some things that are dead are a good thing, aren't they? My barbecue. I would prefer. I don't know about you. You can be different. But I would prefer my cow to be dead. It's a lot easier to get him on the barbecue. You understand that, right? That's how dead works. Some things, dead is good, right? If I'm walking through the woods and I see a snake, dead is good. Okay? I got amen there. Listen, I like creatures too, but snakes, oh my goodness. I think dead is good. You know? But here in verse 20, he says it's useless. A dead cow that is being process to put in your Brookshire's or in your H-E-B or your Walmart or wherever that you shop, that's, that's a good thing, isn't it? It has a purpose. It has a use. Right? They grow them. They raise them for that purpose. Snakes, I don't know what their purpose is in life. I don't know. They, they, I don't think they have a purpose. I can live with the mice that they eat, but I don't know. I can't live with the snakes. So, but here he says in verse 20, he says, it's useless. It's worth nothing. Dead or alive, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how you put a spin on it. Doesn't matter how you twist your words. That faith is worth nothing. It's not worth anything in life. It's not worth anything in death. And when you stand before Jesus one day, He's going to say to you, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you because you had a broken faith. You had a faith that had no purpose. You had a faith that was useless. Now when he says here, foolish person, the Greek there is talking about, if you look in Rogers and Rogers, he points this out. It's talking about 
empty, empty thing. What good is an empty Dr. Pepper can? It's useless, right? Unless you're going to recycle the aluminum, right? It's useless. He says, in, in Rogers and Rogers, he goes on and calls it defective. He says, deficient. Listen, I don't know about you, but I don't want my faith to be associated with those words. Foolish, empty, defective, deficient. Listen, if you go to get your driver's test, I was just looking at faith and that reminded me of driver's test for some reason. <laughs> if you go to get your driver's test and when they give you the score sheet, when you get out of the car and it says that you were deficient, faith, are you going to get a driver's license that day? I passed. <laughs> faith says, I passed. <laughs> she did and she did a good job. But if that piece of paper says that you were deficient, you're not getting a license today, are you? You're not going to pass the test. You're not going to walk across the stage and get that diploma. You're not going to get that degree if you're deficient. If you're empty, listen, I mowed grass last yesterday all day. Actually, all I did was weedy for five and a half hours. That was insanity. But you get thirsty after a while. And when I get to that water bottle, what good is that water bottle if it's empty? I don't want my faith to be empty. And listen, the reason, the reason that we have showed up this morning, the reason that these guys showed up at like 3, 7 o'clock to get all this stuff set up, the reason that we watched the weather all week, so that we can try to make sure that this is going to go off smoothly. The reason that you are here in the parking lot today, the reason that we do all that we do, is so that in the end, your faith and my faith are not associated in this way. That they're not found deficient. That they're not found useless. That they're not found dead. I understand death. And we think that's the end of everything, don't we? But believers, it's different, isn't it? For believers, death is a transition, isn't it? It's a transition from something that was difficult to something that we had to endure daily. I mean, humidity, really? I would venture to say now, I'm going out on a limb here, Phil, because I'm not sure this is Scripture. Okay? But I would venture to say there won't be humidity in heaven. Amen. I'm just saying. Amen. And I'm going to enjoy that peace. But I'm going to enjoy Jesus a whole lot more. Amen. Listen, I don't want you to have a broken faith any more than I do. Now, let's put that to the test. In other words, here's what James is saying. James is saying there is a such thing as broken faith. He says, you people going through life that you don't have a spiritual life, the type of faith that you have doesn't produce a spiritual life. It's just more than what you say. He says, you're just claiming it, but there's continuously no evidence, no proof for others to see. He says, that kind of faith is useless. He says you got to have the right kind of faith. So how do we test that? We test whether or not we continuously say, go in peace. Be warm and be filled. How do we do that? Last week, Josh and Anna, we were talking about them. We filled out cards and letters. We got some more cards today for them. Anna's on the brink of meeting her Savior. Josh, I believe, is on the edge of meeting Him as well. Not in death, but in life. Where it counts. You see, for Anna, there's already been a time 
where she gave her life to Christ and there's evidence. You understand that, right? That's how believers can look at one another and say, I truly believe that Phil is a believer. Why? Because he prayed a prayer one day? No. Because there's evidence in his life. That makes all the difference in the world. And when there's not evidence, that makes a big difference as well. James says, you ought to be able to test it. So, how do we do that today? Let me tell you a story. Miss Linda was telling me this morning about a lady named Leslie Miller. Leslie works with Miss Linda Dietrich. She works together, and last night, Two nights ago, a week ago, a week ago, her house burned to the ground, the house that she lived in. And this is one of her co-workers. So she has nothing, right? Go in peace. In today's world, in today's language, go in peace for Americans is, or for believers is, I'll pray for you. That's how we do that, right? So listen, I think when we come up with true need, not somebody who's just trying to take advantage of a church, not just somebody who's trying to take advantage of, of good people that are just trying to help, I think when we see somebody truly in need, I think that part of the evidence in our life of our true faith is that we don't just say, go in peace. We do something. Listen, if God lays it on your heart to be a part, maybe it's clothes, maybe it's funds, maybe it's groceries, maybe it's whatever. I know there's a lot of people that are helping her out right now, but could it be that God has laid it on your heart to say, you know what? I need to help. I have been blessed. Listen, we're, we're doing church in a parking lot. We have a building that we've paid for. We've worked hard. Wait till you see it inside. Wait till you see all the decorations preparing for the day that we get to be back in there. And we're still doing church in the parking lot. That just doesn't seem fair, does it? It doesn't seem right. But God says, I'm still on the throne. I still have a plan. And you and I, we still need to be a difference in the Josh's, in the Anna's life, in the Leslie's life, and all the others that we run into each and every day. We have to be a part of their lives the same way as if we were in the building. Listen, this, all of you in the parking lot, all of you watching online right now, this is the church. Understand that, right? The building that stands behind us, that can be gone tomorrow, and the church would still exist. We would still function. We would still meet. And we would still make a difference. You understand that, right? So I don't care if you're in the parking lot. Or you're in the building. Or if you're watching at home. You are the church. And you have a mandate from scripture. To be the church. To make a difference. So listen. If God lays it on your heart. To be a help whether it's in Josh and Anna or it's in Leslie or something like that. Listen, I want you to go above and beyond. I'm not going to come past you out a card. I want you to do above and beyond. I want you to fill out a card. I want you to hand it to them. I want you to call Miss Linda Dietrich and say, hey, how can I help? What do they need most? And I want you to make it happen. That does not earn you salvation. You understand that, right? That is not your ticket into heaven. It's evidence that you're already saved. It's evidence that God is real in your life. It's evidence that your faith is not broken, that it's more than what you say. It's more than just what you believe, because the devils believe. It actually produces a spiritual life. It actually produces results. Listen, I'm going to have Brother Phil come. 
and they're going to come and they're going to play a song of invitation. Listen, if you're joining us online for the first time, this is a time where you can make a decision to follow Christ. You can make a decision, believers, to make a difference in someone else's life. I don't care if you're online or, or watching here or where you're at. Listen, we have people that watch online from all over the nation. You understand that, right? I know of people in Oregon. I know of people in Kansas. I know of people in Louisiana. I know of people in New Mexico. I know of people in Florida that are watching our services. You can make a difference in your local community. Can you not? Yes. We are a local body of believers. Whether this is the church of our membership or a church in some other state, you can be a big part in someone else's life in making a difference. I think believers as a whole need to stop saying, go in peace, be warm and be filled. We need to stop using the hop out of, I'll pray for you. How about, that's the reason that person was put in front of you, so that you could do something about the need. Not that someone else could. Not that you just pray for them. I believe prayer makes a difference. And I think you need to pray for them. But sometimes, just sometimes, you're the tool that God wants to be used to meet that need. We might be in the parking lot, but you're blessed. You might be at home watching, but you're blessed. I don't think God blesses us just so that we can hoard it all for ourselves. I think He blesses us so that we would have the ability to bless someone else. I think that's how true faith works. Faith produces works. It does not work the other way around. You cannot earn it. You get to evaluate today your own faith. Listen, if you're not a believer today, there's going to be a phone number on the screen. There's a link there. You can say, you can go to that link to our website. You can, you can put in a prayer request. You can say, I need a pastor to call me in one will. There's people monitoring those phones right now. You say, I just need prayer. Then call that number. And they will be able to help you. They'll be able to pray with you. One of our pastors will be able to contact you. Listen, if you don't know Jesus and you're watching online, or if you don't know Jesus and you're sitting in your car here in the parking lot, you've evaluated your faith and you found it to be foolish, you found it to be deficient or empty, then today is the day of salvation. Don't drive out of the parking lot. Don't click off until you make a decision to follow Christ. If you need help, you call us. Look up the church phone number. If you don't see it there online, you look it up and you call us. And we'll make sure that someone shares with you from Scripture how that you too can know that you have true faith. One that will work in death the same way that it ought to work in life. You do today. Whether it's in the parking lot or there at home, you do today what God is calling you you make a phone call to someone you know is in need. We've mentioned several today. Maybe there's someone else in your life that has been laid on your heart. And you just told them, go in peace. Be warned to be filled. I'll pray for you. And maybe today, James has made it clear that you were the tool that God put in their life. You call them today. You make it right. You meet the need.
thank you for being here today, whether it's online or here in the parking lot. To you guys online, again, happy Father's Day to you guys. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers here in the parking lot today. I'm glad everybody got a shady spot today. Yeah. I think we should... Maybe we should pray for clouds every week. That was nice. I enjoy that. Listen, you be praying for us this week. We'll be praying for you guys. If you need anything, you holler at us. We love you guys. I'm going to ask the team to go ahead and depart and get down the road for us because we want to greet you guys as you leave. We're going to greet you guys online now as we sign off. Thank you for being here. Don't forget that we're here for you. We don't have to be in the building to make a difference. We can still make a difference. We can still pray for each other. We can still meet each other's needs. So you make that known to us and we will help as God sees fit. So thank you for being here today. It's good. It, it was a great day outside of the house of the Lord. <laughs> it's good to see you today. <laughs>